This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1098, recorded on March 21st, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. It's the third night in a row I've seen you, Daniel. I know. You and, you and I are spending a lot of time together. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Tuesday, New York Yacht Club to hear Craig Venter. Yesterday, office hours, and now TWIV clinical update. And each time a different bow tie. Let's yes. see. I can't, you know, I just can't see you. I don't know what you have there. So, uh, anthrax. I've got a couple anthrax bow ties. Oh, you're a fan of anthrax, eh? I, I like anthrax. It's an interesting uh, disease. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, someone on the live stream last night said they, they appreciate that I ask you what's on, on your bow tie because they like to find out. Okay. okay. All right. Well, let's jump into it. We've got a lot to talk about today. Um, and let us start with a rather lengthy quotation. Um, if, as a culture, we don't bear witness to grief, the burden of loss is placed entirely upon the bereaved, while the rest of us avert our eyes and wait for those in mourning to stop being sad, to let go, to move on, to cheer up. And if they don't, if they have loved too deeply, if they do wake each morning thinking, I cannot continue to live, well, then we pathologize their pain. We call their suffering a disease. We do not help them. We tell them they need to get help. And that's from uh, Cheryl Strait from uh, Brave Enough. Um, all right, let's move right into measles, second week in a row that we're talking about measles. Um, last week, we discussed uh, measles, and this week, we have the MMWR Notes from the Field Measles Outbreak, Cook County, Illinois, October-November 2023. Um, and I think this is a very interesting article when it comes to thinking about measles and transmission. Um, and so, so let, let's go through this. Now, during October 5th, November 1st, 2023, five measles cases occurred in unvaccinated vaccine-eligible children aged one to nine years who lived in the same apartment building but did not socialize with one another. Um, during the outbreak, approximately 400 persons were exposed to measles, including 13 children aged less than one year. Um, and I mentioned aged less than one year because uh, here in the U.S., um, that's when we start our um, measles vaccination series in general, sort of with uh, things like this. I'm wondering if we need to start moving that to six months as we recommend for travelers. Um, so, so here's the story. I don't want people to be thinking about, you know, how this uh, virus spread. So, October 10th, 2023, the Cook County Department of Public Health in Illinois was notified by Hospital A, a large pediatric facility, of a suspected measles case in a child uh, aged two. Um, so this is patient A at Hospital A. Um, now, this patient had immigrated from Yemen um, on September 29th um, and had no history of receipt of um, the MMR vaccine. Uh, the child visited Hospital A's emergency department on October 5th with fever, cough, coryza, basically runny nose. Um, and after receipt of COVID-19, influenza and RSV uh, test results, received a diagnosis of an unspecified viral illness. And just imagine how often this is happening every day. How many, how many of these cases can so easily be missed? Um, on October 8th, the child visited Hospital B's emergency department with worsening respiratory symptoms and received a positive rhinoenteroviral test result on a respiratory pathogen panel. Now we know what's going on. After which the child was transferred back to Hospital A and admitted for respiratory distress, uh, bronchiolitis, underlying reactive airway disease. Um, the next day, and I don't people think, the next day, right? So far, so good, no rash. The next day, the child develops this characteristic maculopapular rash. On October 10th, right? Um, this is two days after October 8th when they go to Hospital B's ED. Um, the child's family mentions, you know, by the way, 
um, you know, before we got here, um, this this child was exposed to someone with a clinical diagnosis of measles. Measles is tested for, and on October 11th, we get a diagnosis of measles. So just think about all the time that goes by here, right? Um, so we've got, you know, the uh, first the visit to uh, the the first emergency room. Then we have the visit to the second hospital. To the second hospital. Then we have transfer back to the first. Um, then we have this child in the hospital. Everyone thinking, oh, it's just a common cold. <laughs> um, and then we find out this is a child with measles. Um, it doesn't end there. <laughs> it goes on. Um, so during the child's October 15th, October 5th through 11, um, healthcare encounters ends up with 247 healthcare workers and 177 patients and patient companions um, end up getting exposed. I mentioned 13 children less than one year of age, five immunosuppressed children, um, one child aged over a year, but no vaccine, no history of MMR vaccination. Um, this indexed patient's household contacts include two siblings, also no MMR vaccination. Um, and when they do serological testing, they're susceptible to measles. Um, one sibling aged aged four, we're going to call this patient B. Can you imagine why? Um, they arrived in the U.S. at the same time as the index patient. Um, we've got another sibling, aged nine. That's going to be patient C. Um, both siblings end up developing measles. Um, now, October 30th, Hospital A notifies the Cook County Department of Health that another child aged two, now we're up to patient D, um, who was evaluated in in the ED, fever, cough, coryza, then discharged. Um, the family of that child lived in the same two-story apartment building as the index patient, but on a different floor. Patient D had no history of MMR vaccine. The child's patient reported objections to MMR vaccine based on personal beliefs, perceptions about vaccine side effects. Um, measles was confirmed in this child by PCR testing. On the 30th, the rash doesn't develop until November 1st. So the families of patients A through C and patient D had different cultural backgrounds from one another, spoke different primary languages, and both families reported no contact with the other family. Um, their apartments did not share, did not have shared ventilation. Um, on October 31st, testing was also performed for a sibling of patient D. Now we've got patient E also with measles. Um, again, another child with no vaccination. Um, who had just isolated runny nose um, and was attending a childcare facility. Um, so just just sort of this string of events of what happens here, um, and just you know the the degree of transmission and and you know the sort of special status I guess we we talk about with airborne. We're not even in the same apartment, not even on the same floor, just being in the same building, seeing this uh, transmission going on to the. Um, uh, Daniel, unvaccinated. Uh, how so in the very beginning they missed the diagnosis that first ER visit what should they have done well so that's the really tough thing right um you know it's like how are you supposed to be thinking about this and and probably is a slightly better history right you know here is a child who just arrived from Yemen so you got to be thinking make believe I'm in Yemen and I've got a child coming in, you know, with a rash, uh, you know, at this point, not a rash, but fever, cough, runny nose, you might want to ask, okay, so you're from Yemen, mm -hmm. um, you know, any exposures to things I should be thinking about? You don't just treat this like a local child. Uh, well, now we're going to have to start thinking about measles as part of our local but milieu. Isn't measles virus part of the respiratory panel, like the biofire panel? It's not. It's not. So what we're doing in a lot of facilities, and it looks like this is what happened at Hospital A, we do this, this quad multiplex PCR testing. We're only looking for, as we saw here, we're only looking for COVID, flu mm -hmm. A, flu B, and RSV. And if those are negative, we say, it's all we need to know, moving on here. Um, mm -hmm. So then they go to Hospital B, where they actually do a broader respiratory pathogen panel where they pick up the enterorhinovirus. They port those together, same primers. Um, but no, measles not on there. You've got to be thinking separately and adding measles to your differential.
I don't, do you think that's the right way to go about this or should we add it? You know, it's financial if you think about it. Like if you added, yeah, if you added a measles PCR to every, you know, every workup of the child, you know, we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. Well, I mean, now the, the cases are still pretty rare, right? Yeah. But if we're in the middle of a huge measles outbreak, which could happen, then maybe we should do it. Yeah, I mean, we're already up to I like, just a landmark. We're already we've already seen as many cases, diagnosed as many cases this year as we had all of last year. It's only March. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's got to be, um, but it's really a challenge, right? Because so many clinicians, so many people are sort of taught, you know, rash with fever, you know, a a febrile illness with rash. And as we're seeing here, uh, this transmission and this illness, the rash often comes later on when the immune system kicks in. Yeah. So a lot of transmission occurs before we even see that. All right, now addressing the question, uh, Vincent, you and I discussed last week, why? Why are we having a problem with measles? Um, And we've got the article, Measles surge driven by gaps in routine vaccination following COVID-19 pandemic uh, published in the Infectious Disease Advisor. Um, This isn't really as much a journal as kind of a, uh, um, I don't know exactly what you would call this, but uh, they echo our concerns that this surge is being, uh, that this surge is being driven by um, largely unvaccinated U.S. travelers transmitting the virus to other unvaccinated individuals after returning home from countries where the virus is circulating. Um, You know, the case we read was about someone coming from Yemen, um, but a lot of times we have a a U.S. citizen heading off, visiting the world, coming back, bringing back measles. Um, Measles diagnosis have also increased in the U.S. and globally because of disruptions in routine vaccination following the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, In this article, they point out that, and I think these are numbers people have been asking about, up to 30% of children infecting with measles experience some some degree of complication. So diarrhea, ear infections that can lead to permanent deafness, pneumonia, encephalitis. Um, moreover, approximately 25% of infected children require hospitalization. Um, it's sort of interesting, right? Because was that what we experienced when measles was more common? Are we doing this because it's measles and that's triggering the hospitalization? Um, big number here, each hospitalization can cost over $100,000, right? And this is something I talk about. People are like, oh, it's my choice whether or not I want to vaccinate my children. Yeah, who's going to pay that bill, that $100,000? Forget about Who's going to take care of these children who may end up with permanent deafness, who may end up with cognitive issues after inflammation of their brain? Um, Now, MMR vaccination uptake um, is recommended to be 95% or higher to reduce the risk of transmission. Um, And to give a sense, where are we in 2022? Only 83% of U.S. children were vaccinated against measles. It's bad. It's not good. It's not good. Um, I'm going to leave in a link here to the ID Society has a nice page, Measles and Misinformation, the Impact on Public Health. Um, This is one of those issues where um, we really need to do a much better job of um, information because there's plenty of people out there doing the misinformation. Um, Now, we also got an alert from the CDC Increase in global and domestic measles cases and outbreaks ensure children in the United States and those traveling internationally six months and older are current on MMR vaccination. Mm -hmm. Um, Just to mention, this is a recommendation instead of waiting to 12 months of age. um, If you're going to be traveling internationally with a a child um, between that six months to 12 months, um, you actually want to accelerate and get that uh, measles vaccination um, at six months. Um, ideally, you can get a second one in before you go on your travels. So now we have uh, MPOX. We hadn't talked about that in a while, but we have news of MPOX in the Congo. Um, now, I don't know, Vince, and maybe I'm dating myself. It made me think of the Billy Joel song. <laughs> you know, we didn't start the fire, but I don't know if this is because I'm a New Yorker. I used to live in Oyster Bay. I'm not sure. Um, but we can read about this in the Rapid Communication and Eurosurveillance ongoing MPOX outbreak in Kamatuga, South Kibu province. 
associated with monkeypox virus of a novel clade one sublineage, Democratic Republic of the Congo, 2024. Um, they throw mpox and, and monkeypox in the same sentence, and uh, it's recommended that we not use monkeypox because of some racial concerns. Just sort of bringing that up in your title, by the way. Um, we can get more updated numbers from the WHO that there are over 14,000 suspected cases with over 600 deaths so far. Um, you know what they, you know, people said like, oh, mpox, you know, at least you're not going to die of it. Well, 4.5% case fatality rate. Um, and actually, um, Agam Rao, MD of the CDC's U.S. Public Health Service, he actually suggests the CFR might be closer to 7.4%, so a case fatality rate of 7.4. Um, I will point out important distinction perhaps between clade 1, as we're seeing here, and clade 2 that spread through Europe and the U.S. Um, during the 2022 MPOX outbreak, um, you know, there were 1.3 mpox associated deaths per thousand cases, right? So that gives us a, a CFR of less than less than one, so a 0.13. Um, so quite a bit different, 40 deaths in total, as opposed to here where we've already seen 600 deaths so far. Not clear how much of that is is a is a racial background, is an environmental background, is a nutrition general health background, is a treatment access um, versus really clade one versus clade two intrinsic. Um, so. By the way, Daniel, uh, we got an email from a pox virologist in South America, and she said the disease has been renamed mpox by WHO for the reasons you stated, but. The, the the WHO does not control names of viruses. That is controlled by the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses, the ICTV, and they choose to use monkeypox virus. Okay. Okay. So that's actually, that's that's helpful. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting, um, you know, w we think we get to make all the decisions, but no, there's this international um, taxonomy group that meets and uh, yep, as we learn more and more, things keep changing. Um, all right, RSV, um, you know, th this may be maybe the last time we talk about it for a while because we really have come out the other side. Numbers are really, really down for, for RSV. So uh, good good news there, but but not so good for flu. I mean, flu um, influenza positive tests um, are actually sitting pretty high. Um, and this is an interesting pattern that we've seen um, every so often. Um, the, the classic is influenza um, rates go up stay up for a period of time, and then they come down. Sometimes we get a second hump. Sometimes, um, a few years back, we had this three hump, and that, that looks like we're headed towards that this year. So we had an early peak, got a little better, had another peak, started to get a little better, and now we're headed towards a third peak this season. But again, it's regional, right? If you look at the maps, um, New York City is a little bit better than it was last week. Uh, Michigan is a little bit better than it was last week. Ohio, not so great. Nebraska, um, a few others. So um, part of what we're seeing here is also regional. So sort of check your local um, flu levels. All right. Um, COVID, we, we, we keep saying things are going to get better, but we're, um, we're still looking at um, over 13,000 um, in hospital. We're looking at um, average new deaths still over 200 um, deaths per day. Um, it's starting to come down a little bit. Um, wastewater looks encouraging. Um, so I'm just waiting to see that translate um, into uh, less folks in the hospital, uh, less new deaths. So a few, few things to talk about this week with children and other vulnerable populations, really children. Um, this week we have the MM. WR, Notes from the Field, Surveillance for Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome in Children, United States 2023. Um, just a reminder, the multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children is a particularly serious inflammatory condition that can occur two to six weeks after SARS-CoV-2 infection. It often involves the heart, the brain, the eyes, the lungs, other organ system. Um, this report describes the 2023 um, miss C cases um, and compares them with cases reported earlier in the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Um, there were 117 cases, which the CDC suggests is only a subset of actual cases due to underreporting. Among the uh, 117 Miss C patients with illness onset in 2023, deep breath, 58% had no underlying medical conditions, right? We talked about last week how over 100 children have died of flu um, so far this year. To all apparent, you know, they seemed completely fine. Same thing here. The majority of these children um, were otherwise healthy until this developed. Half of them required ICU level care. 34% experienced shock. 27% experienced cardiac dysfunction. Um, three patients died. So three of these children did not survive. Um, so they made it through the acute COVID, but then during this multi-system inflammatory response, uh, three of these children died. Um, 96% of the patients were age eligible for COVID-19 vaccination. 82% um, um, had not been vaccinated. So only 18% had actually gotten that COVID-19 vaccine, which um, I shall mention reduces the risk of this developing substantially. Among the 48 vaccine eligible patients with underlying medical conditions, 19% um, had documented receipt of any COVID-19 vaccination. Among the 20 patients who had received COVID-19 vaccination, 60% um, received their last dose uh, greater than 12 months before the, uh, the onset. Another one, um, maybe they're reminding people. Uh, this week, we have the article, Guidance for Prevention and Management of COVID-19 in Children and Adolescents, a consensus statement from the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society Pediatric COVID-19 Therapies Task Force, published in JPEDS. Um, and I know um, I bemoan all the folks that don't follow the guidance for adult um, care, but uh, it may be worse here. Um, but this is a nice article for all our pediatricians to look at. You know, what, what is the guidance? Um, and hopefully I've just reminded folks that children can not only die from COVID-19, not only can children end up in the hospital, not only can children end up with long COVID, we might get to that, um, but also um, we can have this multi-system um, inflammatory issue. Uh, so here they, they have a bunch of nice figures um, where they they – really guide you through what to do here and, and how to risk stratify these children. Um, and um, But as mentioned, remember, a lot of those folks that ended up with the uh, multi-system inflammatory issue, they actually were completely healthy and probably would have ended up with low risk on this uh, structure. Um, they talk about some of the, the definite and probable risk factors that are associated, a really nice figure too, and just uh, the odds ratio, if there's an underlying cardiovascular or neurological or seizure disorder, um, those can really have a high um, uh, effect upon your risk of progression. Um, and then, you know, when you start adding up more than one. Um, and then they go through basically, you know, how to approach this. And uh, really striking is they're actually recommending um, treatment for, for those individuals that are um, at risk of progression. Um, and 186 references, so all very evidence-based. So we'll leave in a link for folks to take a look at that. All right, moving into COVID, early viral phase, right? We just had uh, the treatment guidelines there from JPIDs, um, but we also will leave in a link to the NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines that were just updated on February 29th. Paxlovid, remdesivir, malnupiravir, convalescent plasma in some situations. Um, and again, we'll leave links to the updated CDC's um, respiratory virus guidance, what to do when you are sick. A um, little bit new here in week two. So we have number one, steroids at the right time in the right patient at the right dose. Um, number two, anticoagulation guidelines. Uh, I've got some new ones coming out from American Society of Hematology. That's, I think, about all I'm allowed to say. Uh, but just... Uh, I approve the manuscript. I think it looks good. Um, but number three, pulmonary support. Um, we have the article, lower versus higher oxygenation target and days alive without life support in COVID-19, the hot COVID randomized clinical trial published in JAMA. So I, I like the title, the hot COVID uh, title there. Um, these are the results of a multi-center randomized trial were 726 patients in 11 ICUs in Europe with COVID-19 and severe hypoxemia were randomized to different uh, targets. 
Um, at 90 days, the median time alive without life support was 80 days in the lower oxygen group and 72 days in the higher oxygen group. Um, death rate at 90 days was 30% in the lower oxygen group and 34.7% in the higher oxygen, so giving us a risk ratio of 0.86, but overlapping confidence intervals. Um, but let, let us not just get the headlines on this. Let's actually take a, a little closer look. And, and there's a nice editorial on the study, which I think think helps sort of tease apart what are we seeing, what might have happened here. Um, so we have an editorial oxygen supplementation in COVID-19, how much is enough? Um, and here, Richard M. Schwartzstein, um, MD, up at, up at Harvard, writes that the less is more finding could be explained by a number of factors. Uh, more patients in the high target group could have been intubated and started on mechanical ventilation because physicians could not achieve the target with non-invasive ventilation. Um, also comments that the observation that initiation of mechanical ventilation to achieve a high target uh, PaO2 may have occurred is less a failing of the study design than a consequence of using a high um, PaO2 target. Um, so a little concerning um, that this sort of study uh, may have actually triggered um, unnecessary intubations to, to get people at this higher level. So not really clear to me that it was really the, the goal higher level or sort of the forcing um, of perhaps some unnecessary intubations here and affecting these outcomes. So. Um, we also have remdesivir still in the first 10 days, immune modulation. Um, and I will move to a, a couple nice studies here in our um, long COVID section. So uh, the article, Prevalence of Orthostatic Intolerance in Long COVID Clinic Patients and Healthy Volunteers, a multi-center was published in the Journal of Medical Virology. So um, perhaps a little bit of confirmation bias for what many of us treating long COVID patients are seeing and doing in this article. Here, the authors investigated the prevalence of objective orthostatic intolerance in patients attending long COVID clinics um, and healthy volunteers. They also looked at associations with OI, orthostatic intolerance symptoms, and comorbidities. Um, participants with a diagnosis of long COVID were recruited from eight UK long COVID clinics and healthy volunteers from general population. Um, so all undertook standardized um, National Aeronautics and Space Administration lean testing. So NASA lean testing. Um, participants' history of typical OI, or static intolerance, symptoms, dizziness, palpitations, before and during the NLT, the Nasaline test, were recorded. 277 long COVID patients and 50 uh, matched healthy volunteers were tested. Healthy volunteers had no history of these OI symptoms um, or symptoms during the, the Nasaline test or, or POTS. Um, 130, so 47%, just about half of the long COVID patients had previous history of the um, OI symptoms. 52%, so about half developed symptoms during the Nasaline test. 15% um, had an abnormal Nasaline test. 7% um, met criteria for POTS. Um, and 8% had um, orthostatic hypotension. Um, of patients with an abnormal Nasaline test, 45% had no prior symptoms. Um, when they relaxed the diagnostic threshold for POTS, um, they actually got up to about 11% of the long COVID patients, so pulling an additional 4%, um, but not pulling any of the healthy controls. Um, more than half of the long COVID patients experienced the orthostatic intolerance during the Nasaline test. More than one in 10 met the criteria for POTS. Um, now, the investigators conclude by recommending that all patients attending long COVID clinics are offered a Nasaline test and appropriate management commenced. Um, I'm going to make that a little bit broader, right? I mean, this may even be like a way for folks to screen, you know, if they're concerned about, you know, the diagnosis or not. So I just wanted to uh, spend a little time maybe sharing what, what is the Nasaline test? Um, I was going to have you demonstrate for us, Vincent, but don't, don't <laughs> worry, I won't have you do that. I can, I can pass it. It's no problem. <laughs> you can pass. All yeah. right. <laughs> so... Um, it takes a little time. So in the NASA, I always tell the people to buy one of those automatic, um, you know, battery powered uh, uh, sphygmomanometers, blood pressure mm -hmm. machines. 
Um, mm-hmm. and, and what you do is you, you put it on your arm. It's great if someone will help you with this. And um, the participant is going to lie quietly for two to three minutes. Um, and you're going to get a couple uh, readings while they're laying down. I, I often tell them just, just to get one. I mean, I don't want to overburden them because I'm going to make them do this a few times between appointments. Um, record the pulse. Re- record the blood pressure. Maybe even ask someone, you know, comment, how are you feeling? Um, then the participant slowly stands up, right? Don't, don't jump up. We're not springing, no acrobatics. You're going to stand up slowly. And now you're going to stand with your shoulders leaning against the wall for support. Now you're not slumping. You're really just leaning a little bit. What you're trying to do is hold the feet still about 15 centimeters from the wall. Um, so about 10 inches or so. Um, and then you're going to do um, six further readings at about one to two um, minute intervals, right? So you're basically pushing the machine, waiting, getting the numbers. Um, now, you got to stop this prematurely um, if the participant has symptoms, which really make it unable for them to complete it. So they're like, I don't feel well. I feel like I might be dropping down. Um, you know, if you can do this for the full 10 minutes, that's great. Um, and then you're going to look for any of any of these issues. So orthostatic intolerance is going to be you have dizziness, lightheadedness, palpitations, chest pain, tremulousness, um, and, and they get worse. Um, but then improves, gets better when you lay back down. Um, the orthostatic hypotension um, is actually going to be when you have a fall in the systolic, that's the big number, uh, blood pressure within the first three readings of at least 20, or the diastolic, the low number falls by at least 10. Um, and this is with or without acute symptoms. Um, the orthostatic tachycardia, right, it's a little bit easier. When you do this, is the heart rate just going to shoot up? Um, a little higher threshold, 30 uh, beats per minute, um, and you know maybe requiring this to be sustained a couple times depending upon your threshold. Um, and then they go through you know a number of, of different um, other criteria you might be looking for. Um, and so I should I should mention the work that we're discussing here um, was part of the Loco Motion, the Long COVID Multidisciplinary Consortium Optimizing Treatment and Services across the NHS. NHS. Uh, it's a 36-month multi-site uh, case study of 10 long COVID clinics. Um, eight were participating in this sub-study. Um, and this was started back in 2021 and seeking to optimize long COVID care across the uh, clinics. Um, but, you know, one of the things I like about this is it's very objective, right? You know, patients can't, you know, stand up and, you know, I'm going to voluntarily crank my heart rate up 30 points. I'm not going to drop my systolic blood pressure by 20. Um, so it a lot of, takes a lot of the, the um, subjective out of it and gives us, I'll say, more objective validation for what these folks are experiencing. But it also you know, we have, uh, we have a history of knowing how to treat people with orthostatic, orthostatic intolerance. So we can actually start addressing, um, addressing this issue in a lot of these what, folks. Why does COVID exacerbate this? The whole idea is something about um, the post-COVID syndrome um, impacts the autonomic nervous system. Mm-hmm. Now, the exact mechanism we're not sure about. Um, but yeah, we're, we're seeing issues here with, you know, normally when you stand up and, and the reason we're standing, relaxed, legs um, not moving, we don't want the muscles helping with venous return, um, you're expecting the autonomic nervous system to, to constrict um, the peripheral nervous system, peripheral mm-hmm. vascular system, right? So we've sort of made the tank smaller so that we can Got still it. get blood supply to our brain. Um, and here is, uh, I think, really objective evidence that we're having some autonomic dysfunction. And I would suspect this is probably post-inflammatory, right? So a lot of these individuals don't necessarily have this in that first week. A lot of times we see this develop yeah. two to three weeks, you know, or even farther after the acute. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's not just COVID, right? We saw this in a lot of other post-infectious sequelae. Right. But nice to have validation, right? We've been seeing this. We talk about it. But as I like to say, the plural of data is, the plural of anecdote is not data. Here we've got data. Mm-hmm. Um, so not only do we see deaths, hospitalization, and miss C, but we have ongoing issues with long COVID in children. Um, so what about autonomic issues in children? We have the article, Autonomic Cardiac Function in Children and Adolescents with Long COVID, a case-controlled study published in the European Journal of Pediatrics. Um, now, prior studies, like the one right above, focused uh, 
um, on autonomic dysfunction primarily in adults. This study, the authors are looking at pediatric patients with long COVID. So here we've got 56 long COVID pediatric patients, um, mean age about 10, um, and 27 age, sex, and body surface area matched healthy controls. Um, they undergo a standard 12-lead um, EKG, 24-hour EKG Holter monitoring, um, autonomic cardiac function was assessed, a comprehensive echocardiographic study was also obtained, um, and basically the data analysis showed that pediatric, with patient, pediatric patients with long COVID um, also had significant changes. So we're seeing the autonomic dysfunction in the kids as well. And last and least, uh, to briefly mention the article, Iron Dysregulation and Inflammatory Stress Erythropoiesis Associates with Long-Term Outcome of COVID-19, published in Nature Immunology. Um, in this investigation that assessed 214 individuals infected with SARS-CoV-2 with varying disease severity, they found unresolving inflammation, anemia, low serum iron, altered iron hemostasis gene expression. Um, really, I'm going to say an anemia of chronic inflammation. Um, before everyone starts taking iron supplement, I also want to share the University of Cambridge Research Post, a couple nice quotations from there. When the body has an infection, it responds by removing iron from the bloodstream. This protects us from potentially lethal bacteria that capture the iron in the bloodstream and grow rapidly. It's an evolutionary response that redistributes iron in the body and the blood plasma becomes an iron desert. It isn't necessarily the case that individuals don't have enough iron in their body. It's just that it's trapped in the wrong place. What we need is a way to remobilize the iron and pull it back into the bloodstream where it becomes more useful to the red blood cells. So we don't really know if iron supplementation is helpful, um, and this study does not tell us that answer. Okay, so I will finish as we've been finishing for over four years. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Uh, I want everyone to pause the recording right here. Go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com and click on the Donate button. Um, even a small amount helps. Uh, we are now doing our American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene fundraiser, where for February, March, and April, we double your donations up to a potential maximum donation of $20,000. A portion of these funds will go to providing travel awards for two female qualified students, early career investigators. And uh, those applications, I guess, are going in right now for these folks. It's time for your questions for Daniel. You can send yours to Daniel at microbe.tv. Jeff writes, I am a general pediatrician, and I would love to hear your thoughts on applying the new CDC guidance for COVID and other respiratory illnesses to children who often have mild symptoms, particularly as it relates to, to return to school recommendations. I saw a five-year-old recently with two days of congestion and slight cough. She had a COVID exposure and tested positive when does she go back to school? She never felt particularly ill, so maybe the guidance doesn't apply. Most children at this stage will not reliably wear a well-fitted mask for any length of time, so perhaps instead she should be excluded longer for that reason. Since the guidance is intended to be more general, does it mean that all children with runny noses should be masking at school or perhaps only those that have had fevers? I'm not sure what that would mean for the lunchroom or gym class where masking is not a serious option for most children. Any thought you have would be greatly appreciated. You yeah, know, so th this is really great, right? I mean, to, and we really need to have these discussions. Um, you know, how, how, do we, how do we go forward? How, how have we addressed this in the past? How do we want to address this in the future? Um, do we want to make it such that, that getting that positive COVID test becomes something associated with a punitive restriction? Um, it's really tough. Um, you know, for a lot of a lot of children, um, let's say they're a low risk, and, and the the test is not necessarily going to affect how you um, how manage them clinically. Or they're not maybe going to be a person who ends up on antivirals. Um, you know, then then it becomes one question. If it's an individual who maybe is higher risk, and we talked about um, the fact that there's a, a nice uh, guidance publication on you know what puts individuals at, at higher risk. 
um, you know, so where they may actually end up with treatment. Um, this is really tough. We we know that the virus um, is is such that an infected person is contagious for those those really the first five days and a little bit into the second five days. Uh, the reality you bring up is is children are not going to wear a properly fitting mask uh, while they're eating lunch, while they're in the gymnasium. Um, and we have a society that is structured where you really can't miss um, a week every time you end up having an issue. We, we, we shut down most of the remote learning options in a lot of settings. So um, I, I think there's, there's a lot of bigger public health questions that we need to ask as a society. Um, how are we going to, how are we going to go forward? And I think, you know, the, the previous uh, CDC guidance was often ignored. And in a situation like this, I don't think there's going to be a lot of parents that are going to be excited to have their child miss a, a full week of um, learning opportunities. And for them, maybe whoever the caregiver is, um, having that impact on work to keep a seemingly um, minimally impacted child um, at home to protect society. Jay writes, I know you enjoy using data to set the record straight when rumors get going, so I thought you might be interested in sharing your two cents about the following situation. There has been some conversation in wildlife management circles about people's rabies antibody titers falling off precipitously after being sick with COVID-19. These are folks who have rabies pre-exposure vaccination due to anticipated wildlife encounters and who get their titers checked regularly to determine if, when they need a rabies booster. Is there any mechanism that would explain a causal effect of SARS-CoV-2 infection, COVID illness on rabies titers in a rabies vaccinated person? It's interesting. Um, so I'm not familiar with any sort of literature, you know, showing this. So um, it sounds like this would be a very interesting study to maybe follow a number of people and see what sort of the normal um, contraction trajectory is, the kinetics there, um, and then see if there's any kind of impact here with a, with a um, case of COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, you know, it came up on our live stream, right, that, that certain um, situations like a measles um, infection can be associated with a loss of, uh, of memory, um, you know, and, and some interesting things we've learned about that, the ability of that virus to actually target memory cells, particular receptor on the memory cells and, you know, and thinking. I mean, that makes sense. That's probably what's going on. But um, there is some... Um, you know, growing evidence about all the, the post-COVID impacts on B cells and T cells. So I'd be sort of thinking about something along those lines if we really confirm this association. Um, but yeah, interesting. Um, I, I should mention just because we're on rabies and I really like rabies and I need a rabies bow tie. So if anyone knows where I can get a really nice rabies tie and modify it. But um, yeah, what what is a protective titer against rabies? Because we have a lot of these, you know, you go to the lab and there's some kind of a cutoff and, and uh, you know, working with vets, I was mentioning, I spent a lot of time in Fort Collins, Colorado, um, you know, people who are exposed uh, either in zoos or veterinary situations um, will get their, their titers checked. Um, and there's sort of an idea that there's a the threshold, a protective titer. Um, I don't know how true that is, right? Um, if you actually look at, so where do we get the data on this? Um, you know, some of the data comes from, from animals, right? So uh, there's a nice study on, on vaccinated raccoons um, where what they did is they actually grouped them into sort of three categories. And so um, they had a bunch of the vaccinated raccoons who had negative titers. It didn't pick anything up. So below the measurable um, titer. And um, about 40% of them survived. Then they looked at, uh, you know, the group that had higher antibody levels and, okay, 90% of them survived. And then they had ones that had this really high um, titer, 100% survival, right? So sort of suggestive that there are certain, um, you know, correlations there between the, the antibodies. And, and, you know, maybe better is almost to, you know, you, you get the rabies exposure and you see how quickly the amnestic antibody response comes up. Uh, but just just interesting stuff here, and I'd love to yeah I'd love to see if this pans out if this is is a real issue, and if you need to start rushing out and getting all those uh, folks uh, revaccinated for rabies. So there is a CDC page on this, and it says the uh, there's no protective titer against rabies, but the ACIP recommends a neutralization of rabies virus at a serum dilution of, of one to five as minimum evidence of circulating antibodies, and. If it's lower than that, then 
you get revaccinated. You get another shot, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eli writes, is there any evidence that giving COVID vaccine after COVID infection and recovery gives more protection against reinfection? Yeah, so there is, you know, we, we call this hybrid immunity, right? And we've we've often talked about how if you get an infection, sort of waiting the three months before you get your vaccination. Um, and, you know, this is, I always joke, like, you know, one of the best ways to not get COVID is to get COVID, right? <laughs> so uh, so if, you, if you had COVID, you know, and it's three months later and you want to reduce your chance of getting it, um, getting a vaccination on top of that actually can reduce your chance, um, you know, below what it would be if you didn't add that vaccination on top of a prior um, infection. And Brendan writes, sorry if you've discussed this already, I see in this study, so the study uh, that Brendan sends is um, COVID-19 rebound after VV116 versus nirmatrelvir ritonavir treatment, a randomized clinical trial in uh, JAMA network open. Mm. Uh, the authors noted that viral load increases as part of some rebounds which has me concerned about giving patients dexamethasone in the second week. Can you please ask, can you please <laughs> ask Dr. <laughs> Griffin? Yeah, I'm asking him what we should do with this knowledge and what sort of testing is available for patients and clinicians to know if it's a viral rebound or just the inflammatory phase. Would a rat show or could the mucous membranes already have defeated the virus? So no positive tests then, yet instead the battle rages on somewhere else. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to actually discuss that article on our next TWIV. I already put it in my show notes. And so uh, I recognize the study you're talking about. Um, and a nice thing I can actually quote from, from that study. Well, not quote, but I paraphrase because I'm not sure I remember exactly. Um, but they make a point that um, there was no correlation between a return of symptoms in that second week and an increase in the in the um, in the virus, so in, in the PCR and the quantitative PCR that they're doing there. So that's the first thing to point out, right? Because that's what clinicians tell us they're seeing. So, oh, I saw this patient and they started to get better. And the second week they got worse. I just want to point out that the majority of time, those people that are having symptoms in the second week, there's no virological rebound. That is the early inflammatory phase. That, that is part of the disease process. Whether you treat them or not, um, we're still going to potentially see that if you treat them with the oral remdesivir, the VV116, or with Paxlovid, um, the severity of that early inflammatory phase is going to be uh, decreased markedly. The chance of them ending up hypoxic or in the hospital is going to go down markedly. So here's the other thing which I think is interesting. So what do you really want to know? Do you want to know when they're having symptoms if there is a, an increase in that, that PCR um, level? Do you really want to know that because you're going to do something about it. And I want to point out we have years of evidence that jumping in late is not helpful. You're just throwing unnecessary antivirals at someone um, when they're now in the, in the inflammatory phase. Um, and that gets in, I think, to your second question. Oh, my gosh. What if we give these folks um, steroids? during that second week. Let's say we have an indication the saturation is below 94% on room air. Um, you know, we have the recover data, but now we have a growing number of other studies showing that there can actually be a mortality um, benefit to treating these folks with steroids. Um, if we follow those folks out and keep doing PCRs, um, folks that get um, the steroids, are they going to have a longer period of PCR positivity? Um, and yes, the odds ratio to that is probably about three to four. So you will, by giving the steroids, you'll save their lives, <laughs> you know, about 25% mortality reduction if you quote the uh, recover data. Um, but yeah, um, you know, it's sort of equivalent to being overweight, having a BMI of greater than 30 also has a um, odds ratio of four for ongoing um, PCR positivity out past that, you know, sort of day 10. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things that I'm not sure that it clinically would be any reason to withhold potentially as a life-saving intervention, the steroids. Um, but certainly nothing in here suggesting um, that more antivirals is appropriate. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone be safe.